chapter 25, Genesis 25. Just real quickly, I'll put back up on, or I did put back up on the board, kind of the genealogy that the whole story of humanity is wrapped up in. Obviously, it started with the first human, Adam, uh, Adam and Eve. God created Adam from the dust, took a rib from of Adam and made Eve. They, of course, had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Seth was a, another seed that God raised up for Eve. And the story then begins to be traced through Seth. Uh, we get down to, from Seth, we get to Noah, of course, and then God uh, destroys the earth because of the wickedness of humanity. Noah had three sons. Um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And of course, Shem is the line that God uh, ordained to follow uh, to get us to ultimately the Messiah. From Shem, many descendants between Shem and Terah, but Terah is where the story kind of picks up at the end of Genesis 11. And of course, Terah's son was Abraham. Terah had three sons, but Abraham was one of those sons. And then the story picks up with Abraham, who had a promise seed. God said, I'm going to give you descendants that will be like, uh, they'll be multitudinous. They'll be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And uh, he got to be the age of 90 and still did not have one. And so he and his wife, Sarah, concocted the plan whereby he would have a seed raised up through his handmaiden or, or Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. And that was the, the outcome of that, of course, was Ishmael. That was not God's promise. And so at the age of 100, um, Abraham and Sarah then had Isaac, who was the promised seed. And this is kind of where we left off last week. We're going to get into Jacob and Esau now. And then we'll pick up the story of Jacob for about three weeks. And then Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, uh, for the final three weeks, it'll lead us up to the Thanksgiving holiday. So we uh, are picking up the story in Genesis 25, and we kind of come in, come to the end of the, the Isaac story, at, at least in the sense where the Isaac is kind of the main player, uh, because really Isaac probably gets the least amount of time when you think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Isaac gets the least amount of time. Actually, Joseph gets the most time, and he's not even in this line because of the 12 sons of Jacob. It will be Judah that will be the son that the, the Messiah will come from. But beginning in chapter 37, all the way to 50 is the story of Joseph. So he kind of gets the prime time story. Ishmael gets just a little, or Isaac gets just a little piece, but we're kind of closing that. A piece up today. So let me just kind of walk through the introduction. Um, Abraham, of course, was promised a seed. And um, God said in Genesis 15 to Abraham, uh, I am your exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, that's nice, but I still want a seed. And so then God uh, reinstituted the covenant with him. And um, as I mentioned, he and Sarah concocted the plan whereby Ishmael was born, but that was not God's promised seed. We looked last week how that Ishmael and Hagar were separated from uh, Abraham and Sarah. Sarah became jealous of Hagar once she gave birth, and so Ishmael and Hagar are kind of pushed away. And then finally, that child comes to Sarah through Abraham, and it, of course, is Isaac. Then we get to 22, Genesis 22 that we talked about last week. So now they finally have their son, and God says, I want you to sacrifice him. So in Genesis 22, we talked about last week, he takes um, Isaac to the top of the mountain, raises the knife, and God said, stop, and he has a ram provided in the thicket, a provision. It's called Jehovah Jireh. He names the place Jehovah Jireh. You've provided and um, this sacrifice is provided to take the place of Isaac. So when we get to chapter 23, um, Sarah dies. So she now steps out of the story. Um, 
Abraham sends his servant in 24 to find a bride for Isaac. That bride, of course, is Rebekah. We'll pick up that story today. Abraham then remarries uh, in 25, and he remarries Keturah, and they have uh, some offspring. And then we get to 25, 7, 25, Genesis 25 and verse 7. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael. They reunited to bury him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre. That is where Sarah was buried as well in the field of Ephron, the son of Zophar, the Hittite field, which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. And Abraham was buried and Sarah, his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac and Isaac dwell, dwelt at Beer Lahoy Roy. So now we move on to, we're going to get a real quick little snippet about the other son, uh, the, the son named Ishmael. So we'll look at that first. This is beginning in verse 12. This is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, who Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. These were the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebajoth, then Kedar, then Adbeel, then Mibsam, then Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. And again, not only are those terrible names, but can you imagine, you know how mothers, when they, they have three or four kids and they're mad at one and they list, can you imagine being number 12 on that list when mom gets ticked off at you? But anyway, I just read that and I think that's funny. So, um, and these were the sons of Ishmael and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, 12 princes, according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt as you go toward Assyria. And he died in the presence of all of his brethren. Now, just a couple of things about we're not going to spend much time with Ishmael, but like his father, Abraham, and like his brother, Isaac, he does receive the blessing of offspring. Um, even though he wasn't the chosen seed through which the Messiah would come, God still blessed him with offspring, but he did not receive the covenant as did Isaac. He was gathered to his people in 2517, like Abraham, but he was not gathered to the same people that Abraham was gathered to. And the separation kind of underscores the difference between human effort as a substitute for obedience. Ishmael was the result of human effort. Abraham and Sarah said, let's get Hagar. Isaac was the result of promise and obedience. And so, again, there's this very clear line of demarcation between human effort and obedience to God. It's also interesting that there are 12 tribes from Ishmael, 12 princes. So again, uh, the same as we will see that will come from Jacob later. And they are said to have a future, but we will see even more so the tribes that emerge from Jacob that ultimately proceeded from Isaac. They will be uh, the promised seed will come from them. Then we move to Isaac and his descendants, beginning in verse 19. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, who will be really big in just a couple of weeks in the story. And Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. 
and Rebecca, his wife, conceived, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled, when the days when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in the womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she, that is Rebecca, bore him. So this section that gives us the genealogy of Isaac is framed by his age. In verse 20, he is 40 years old. And when we get to verse 26, he is 60 years old. So we're talking about this period of time, these two decades that show up just in these, what, seven verses. The first crisis that Isaac experiences is the infertility of his wife, Rebecca. And uh, so he prays, he seeks the Lord and God answers his prayer, but it happens after 20 years of interceding for that to take place. Now, the second crisis then is the struggle for the supremacy of twin uh, of the twins. Who is gonna be the supreme um, child that comes from this union between Isaac and Rebecca. So she gets pregnant and there is this struggle. She knows it's more than just your ordinary picking inside um, the womb. There is something going on that is out of the ordinary. And so she inquires of the Lord, why is this? And the Lord says, there are two nations in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One will be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And yes, Bob. Bob asked how she inquired of the Lord. I would say, I mean, it's certainly possible that she, that Melchizedek could have been around and she could have inquired of him. I think that my sense is that when God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the evening. And he clearly still spoke to them even afterwards, but it was much more muffled that they passed on to their families how to connect with God. I mean, Noah built altars, Abraham and Isaac built altars. I think there is oral transmission of this is the way to talk to Yahweh. And I, I don't think until the priesthood is established that there is really that uh, methodology. Now, I know Melchizedek is this, again, if you believe he's a Christophany, then he wouldn't have been around. It would have been an appearance. He wouldn't have been around. He would not have. Been, and, and so if he was really indeed a real person, the king of Jerusalem he would not have been in this area for them to inquire from. So my sense is that it's just an oral transmission passed on where families know how to connect to Yahweh. That, it, it is, yeah, it is. Uh, but you would have to allow, if, if you're going to put Melchizedek in the story, number one, he can't be a Christophany because Christophanies just appear and are gone. And number two, he'd have to be on vacation where they're at. So it's my only, it's my only thoughts. All right, so, um, so she inquires of a Lord who tells her, "This is what's going on. There are two nations inside of you." And of course, on this side of it, we know that's Jacob and Esau. And as we read, she has two sons, and uh, the first one came out, and he was red, hairy, all over. So they called his name. Esau, which means hairy or animalistic. So there's kind of, even in the text, there's kind of a poking fun at him. 
And then Jacob, the younger, comes out holding on to the heel of his brother, almost like I'm trying to get out first kind of thing. And and he's and, and so his name, he is named Jacob, which means heel grabber. All right. So they weren't all that creative in their naming, apparently, but um, but it implies grabbing or clutching or clinging. It will also become that which describes his deceptive nature. And um, that will become very apparent in the life of Jacob. So the promise is, as, as the twins emerge, the promise is, yes, Esau is the eldest, but the older one is going to serve the younger one. That's what God says to Rebekah. Now, just kind of put this in the back of your head. However, and it's a great question that Bob asked, however she inquired of the Lord, she received some kind of answer. She, she knew what was going on. And so put in the back of your head that she already had in her head that the younger was going to rule over the older. She knows that. Now, that may not be common knowledge to anyone else, but she is aware of that. She will do, I'm just giving you the, this is the spoiler alert, as if you didn't already know it, but she's going to do very much what Abraham and Sarah did, try to make God's promise happen. And she will do that by subverting uh, the ordinary plan. And, and that's going to lead to all kinds of family dysfunction and drama that will go on and on and on. And in a very real way still continues to this day. So we now move to verse 27. Um, the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter. He was a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, how many see trouble brewing already? All right. If this is the first time you read this, again, we have our lifetime of reading this. We know the story. But if you're reading this the first time, holy cow, we've got problems. Dad likes Esau better and mom likes Jacob better. And that's exactly what, and can I just tell you again, when we get into these, these stories here, all the way rest of the rest of the way to chapter 50, do not clean these things up and over-spiritualize them. These are human beings grappling for the will of God and failing as much, if not more, than they succeed. And God still ultimately will accomplish his purpose. So the prophesied conflict is revealed immediately after the prophecy. We go to verse 29. Jacob, who is a homebody, cooks a stew. And Esau, who is the hunter, comes in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with some of that red stew, for I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. And, and Esau will be the father of the Edomites. Um, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? By the way, I think that was like, you know, we always say women cause drama or make dramatic statements. I think that was a little dramatic, all right? I don't think he was really about to die, but that's how he felt. There are some drama queens even on the male side of the gender spectrum. And uh, then Jacob said, swear to me this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. And thus Esau despised, that is, he treated as insignificant. We think of despise as I'm angry at. Despised here means he treated his birthright as it was insignificant. All right? Kind of walk through the story. The boys knew. I think this is important. The boys would have known their grandfather, Abraham. He died when they were 15. So can you imagine um, him telling them about the promises? Um, from God promised me, from my seed will be the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea in descendants. So he points to the stars. You can just imagine some of the stories they heard, but they're going to have to work it out on their own. 
All right. So the description of Esau is generally a negative one in the Old Testament. Uh, the law did make provision for the eating of meat, but still the ideal, it seems like in the Old Testament, is not the, the, the hunter guy. The ideal seems to be the shepherd model for leadership. We see that in the Torah. Moses was a shepherd as well. Um, and true Israel is to be like their God who is the Lord is my shepherd. So Esau is always kind of treated in description in kind of a negative tone. Notice this too. I find this fascinating. Esau's failure is in tasting the food. That's what causes him to lose the birthright. What caused Adam to lose the promise? He tasted that which he was not supposed to taste. Even Noah, his downfall was drinking and becoming intoxicated. And at the end of this story, Isaac is going to fail uh, when he eats the food that Jacob has prepared for him instead of instead of Esau. So there's kind of this motif of failure through, we think about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. This would certainly fit in the lust of the flesh, having an appetite for that which we are not to partake of seems to be the downfall in all of these patriarchs. Isaac and Rebecca each loved, but there was clearly parental favoritism that will cause conflict and it will be passed on. All right. Jacob, who is the benefactor or the beneficiary, I guess, of being the favored son, is going to have his favorite son, Joseph, who he's going to make this coat for and create all kinds of havoc. So again, there's a lesson here. We can over-spiritualize it and think, well, what's that mean to me? Or we can see that even for parents, it's crucial that, that, that we treat our children. We love our children. We don't uh, display a favoritism. Um, th there are just lessons about parenting, even in this. And, um, you know, he is, he's not a, um, Isaac and Rebecca are not stellar parents. And uh, David was not a stellar, David's whole kingdom unraveled because of his poor parenting. It's easy just to whitewash that and, and not draw any lessons out of it, but there are lessons to be learned, all right? So now everybody is texting their non-favorite child and telling them they love them right now. I understand. Should we just pause to do that so we get everybody on the same? All right. So um, Esau comes in from a day of hunting. He's famished. He's impulsive. Um, and he says, give me some of that food. And Jacob says, um, you give me the Bakora, the birthright. Birthright was the rights of the firstborn. The honor of that position was the right of succession. And a double portion, listen, this is going to be really important. You're going to want to get this. So the birthright came with it, the right of succession. So the seed would have traveled through Esau had he maintained the birthright, the right of succession. In other words, Isaac's name would have passed on through Esau had he maintained the birthright. So that's the Bacora. The, so the rights of the firstborn are the honor of that position, the rights of succession, and a double portion of the father's inheritance. Just This is way down the road, but we'll get there. Um, it'll be in one of the last couple of lessons. But when Joseph sits with his brothers at the table in Egypt and he feeds them and they don't yet know it's Joseph, and um, he is feeding them and all the brothers are around the table, he will give a double portion to Benjamin, who is the youngest. It's a really cool story. I mean, he's the youngest, probably the maybe the one that eats the least, and he gets two helpings of mashed potatoes. It's really cool if you watch the story and, and you can just imagine, and we're gonna we're gonna slow it down when we read that because the text makes a point of that. And he is, he's making a point to his brothers that we'll get to 
here in just a few weeks. Now, something interesting about the birthright. When there are three or more children, the eldest would receive a double blessing and the others would split the remainder. So if, if there are three children, then um, the first child gets half and the other two get a quarter. And so if there are nine children, the eldest would receive two ninths and the other eight would split the seven ninths. But the kind of weird thing here is when there's only two children, the older the elder gets it all, a double portion. And I, it doesn't seem fair, but that's the way their birthright worked. That's what a double portion is. I mean, so it, it, you don't split it in half. He would get it all. So what Esau is giving up here, and by the way, that's going to become really important in Genesis 38 when um, the second son of, of Judah does not want to raise up a son for his brother who has already died because he would have to shift his inheritance. He would lose his inheritance. So this whole inheritance thing's a big deal. We'll talk about that when we get to Genesis 38. So Esau is going to lose a lot. So in the family of Abraham, the one who had the birthright possesses the covenant. And Jacob is vying for the family fortune and the right to define the destiny of the family. So Esau, I'm about to die. He has no faith. He lives for the moment. He's impulsive. And Jacob makes him swear, which makes this promise irrevocable. And again, notice two kind of worldviews here that we can learn from. There is deferred prosperity, or there is instant or immediate gratification. We live in a world today where people are interested in the second worldview. They want instant gratification. Christians are supposed to lay up treasures in heaven, knowing that we will defer prosperity because we believe there is heavenly treasure that much outweighs instant gratification, right? And so Jacob and Esau represent, again, two different worldviews. Esau is like the world today. I want what I want now. I'll worry about the consequences later. And he gets what he wanted then. The consequences later were grave. And so there's a great lesson even about our worldview and our understanding of what matters and does not matter. So Esau despises. He treats with irreverence and contempt, his birthright. So there's some further digression. Um, I, if you're okay with me reading chapter 26 through with a couple of comments, um, but quickly, I'm going to do that. I, I'm actually going to do it whether you're okay with it or not. I don't even, I have no idea why I would say something so silly. I hope you're okay with it, all right? Um, there was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Notice Isaac's doing what Isaac's dad did. There's a famine, and he's trying to get out. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land. I'll be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give these lands and I'll perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And I'll make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So Isaac, being warned by God, did not go all the way to Egypt, dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked about his wife. Like father, like son, she's my sister. For he was afraid to say she's my wife because he thought lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca because she is beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass uh, when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there 
with Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, I said that lest I die. What a terrible line on account of her. Isn't that awful? Um, parents should always say to their daughters, um, if your father-in-law-to-be will throw his wife under the bus, so will your husband-to-be. So um, Abimelech said, what is this that you have done to us? When the people might soon have lain with your wife, you would have brought killed on us. So um, Abimelech charged all his people, saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him, and the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us. You're much mightier than we. Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water. There's a lot of sermons here. I'm just giving you the big picture, so we have to skip over these. Uh, he dug the wells in the days of his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he called them by the names which his father had called them. And then also Isaac's servants dug in the valleys and found a well running water there. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen. Water's ours, so he called the name of the well Esek, because they quarreled with them. They dug another well, and they quarreled over that one, and he called it Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called it Rehabah, because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. And he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Don't fear. I am with you. I will bless you and multiply my descendants or your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, and he called the name of the Lord, and he pitched a tent there, and Isaac's servants dug a well, and Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahazoth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of the army. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me? Because you hate me, and you've sent me away. But they said, we've certainly seen the Lord is with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you so that you won't do us any harm, since we've not touched you, since we've done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now blessed to the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. They rose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass on the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug. And he said, then we found water. So he called it Shava, for the name of the city is Beersheba or Beersheba. To this day, when Esau was 40 years old, he took his wives, Judith, daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Basamoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they were a grief of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. They married Canaanite women, and that was a problem to his family. Let me just walk through the pieces of this story. This narrative will further affirm the transfer of the divine blessing from Abraham to Isaac. Again, the repetitions of Abraham's earlier journey away from the land of promise. There's the famine, there's the she is my sister motif. There's the wealth, there are the quarrels, there are the separation, the alders, the calling on the name of the Lord, all this that happened with Isaac. The Lord appeared to both Abraham and Isaac in a theophany, that's an appearance of God. Theo is God, phane is where we get phantom, so it's an appearance of. God had a dialogue with Isaac, just like he dialogued with Abraham. And when he obeyed, like Abraham, God blessed him. Isaac reopens the wells of Abraham. He gives them the same names. This account of Isaac among the Philistines very much mirrors his father's steps. He receives similar tests. He receives similar promises. But at the end, despite the digression and the missteps, he is safe in Beersheba. And he's given a treaty with the people. And this is the place where Abraham's initial impact or pact with the Philistines took place. And it's another sign that the covenant's now being handed over to Isaac. 
So that's an important text in the story. Then verse 34, the family conflict now becomes full-blown because Jacob is going to steal not just the birthright, but the blessing. Esau marries a Hittite, which causes his parents grief, um, and his marriages actually frame the narrative that we are going to look at in, in the final few moments today. So look again at verse 34. When he's 40, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Basamoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. So this is the beginning of this narrative. Um, Esau marries the Hittite and causes his parents' grief. What is interesting is a couple of things here. Abraham, remember, in chapter 24, made a provision to make sure that Isaac had a wife from their people. I mean, he went to great lengths to send his servant back and make sure that Isaac had a wife that was not of the Canaanites. When Jacob flees in just a little while, after stealing the blessing, Isaac and Rebekah will make provision for Jacob to get a wife that is from the family or from that same line. But Esau takes his own wives. Now, are his parents negligent or is he strong-willed? And, and I think we kind of have to make our own choice on interpreting. Either way, he has broken the patriarchal practice by contracting his own wives. Now, again, is that is that Rick because the parents kind of like too bad? Or is he just strong-willed? We don't know. The text doesn't say, but we know that he broke the patriarchal plan, just like Abraham got a wife for Isaac, and Isaac will get a wife for Jacob. Esau does not involve mom and dad in this at all, and he gets his own wives. He shows disrespect for the covenant of his grandfather, Abraham. And it will result in just horrific consequences. Now, let's go to 27. Uh, it came to pass when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. So he called Esau, his older son, and he said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. And he said, behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat and my soul may bless you before I die. At this point, he is 100 years old. He's beyond the age of procreation, unless you're Abraham, um, but he will live to be 180, actually. Um, normally, the blessing is public, but here he seeks to do it secretly. Uh, when we get to 49 and 50, Jacob will bless his sons, and it will be a public setting, at least in the sense that the whole family will be gathered around when he does it. Moses does the same thing in Deuteronomy 33. It's a public blessing. In Esau's mind, the birthright which he sold and the blessing are distinct so he thinks, okay, I sold that birthright a long time ago, but I can still get a blessing. They're actually intricately linked together. But Esau wants the blessing, but listen, he has not wanted the prerequisite lifestyle. And again, I could just camp there and preach a Sunday morning sermon. A lot of us want the blessing without the prerequisite lifestyle. We want God bless me but we don't want to live the life. That's been Esau's um, mode of operation uh, from the get-go. So this is going on. Isaac says, son, go out, get food. I want to bless you before I die. He even says, I don't know, I don't know the day that I'm going to die. It, you know, it almost get the sense that he was feeling really horrible that day. He doesn't die for many more years. His eyesight's dim, he's old, and he thinks I better do this before. You know, I'm 
unable to do it. So that's going on. Then on the other side, in verse 5, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. By the way, remember who was listening through the tent when the angels were talking to Abraham. Sarah was listening through the tent when she found out she was going to have a baby. She laughed. Remember that? So, so Rebecca uh, has learned from her mother-in-law how to put a cup up against the tent and hear what's going on. And so she is listening in on the conversation. And um, let me read on. She's listening. When Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and bring it, so Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I'll make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it, and then he may bless you before his death. I mean, there is family dysfunction going on here. You see that big time. She wants theologically what God clearly designed, but her methods are deplorable. Favoritism is clear. She says, she calls Esau your brother, not my son. All right. She knows the plan of Isaac. She even says he's going to do it in the presence of the Lord. And that kind of adds to the credibility of her, of the promise. And in verses eight through 10, she gives these instructions to Jacob and she tells him to hurry, get that food. I'm going to get it ready for you so you can get the blessing. So verse 11 and 12, and Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Notice that Jacob is not wrestling with the ethics or the morality of the plan, only the feasibility. He doesn't say, well, I really don't think God would be very pleased with me. He just says, I don't want to get caught. All right, you, you get that? That's what he's arguing about here. Victor Hamilton said, he who is later capable of wrestling with God wrestles little with his mother or with his conscience. Really interesting. Later on, he's going to say, this life has to change. But right now, he's in it for him, but he doesn't want to get caught. Verse 13. Um, his mother said to him, I don't want you to hate Rebecca, but she's a little bit deceptive, don't you think? All right. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me. I'll take that for you. That's on me. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. And he went and he got them and he brought them to his mother and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Rebecca took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau which were with her in the house. She put them on Jacob, her younger son, and she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. And so he went to his father and he said, my father, and he said, here I am. Uh, well, was, actually, I went to stop at 17. So she's willing to take the fall or the curse. She said, you just obey me. It, it'll be on me. She heard the promise that the older, she, she had heard that. She had heard God say, the older is going to serve the younger. So she knows that. I told you that earlier. However, she inquired of the Lord. She knew that. But now she's trying to make happen. See, Abraham and Sarah knew that they were going to have a seed that was going to bless the nations. And when they got nervous because it wasn't happening, they tried to make it happen themselves and they got Ishmael. Now Rebecca is trying to move the plan of God, or at least the prophesied decree of God, and do it on her own. All of Genesis, people are trying to make God's plan work themselves, and they always create conflict. If there's nothing else 
that we can take away from the story of Genesis. It is, if if it's only this, it's worth it. We should we should obey God's plan, but not try to make God's plan work. We should just walk in it instead of trying to help Him. We always get in trouble when we try to make it happen ourselves. Now, read on. We're in verse 18. So he went to his father and he said, my father. And his father said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, well, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly? I mean, he may have lost his sight, but he hadn't lost his mind. And he thought, man, I know you're a good hunter, but that was awful fast. And he said, because the Lord, your God, look at this. Now he blames it on God, all right? Instead of admitting, you know what? Right, you're right, Dad. This is a game. I shouldn't have done this. He Now he throws God into the mix. Because the Lord, your God, brought it to me. I just went out to hunt, and I just got outside on the back porch and the stuff was there and I shot it and we got her ready fast. Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you're really my son Esau or not. Can you imagine Jacob's heart pounding at this point? I mean, he knows his dad's on to something. Um, and can I just say one other thing? The more you lie, the more you deceive, the easier it gets because his whole life is gonna be a life of deceit. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him. And he said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but their hands are the hands of Esau. Well done, Rebecca. All right, she did that. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy, like his brother's, Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. So he had one last chance to bow out. Um, he said, bring it near to me and I'll eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate, brought him wine and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me. My son came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing. And he blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven of the fatness of the earth and plenty of the grain and wine. Let people serve you. Let nations bow down to you. Be master over your own brethren. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. And cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. That's the promise that was made to Abraham, that was made to Isaac, made to the Jewish people, and now is made to Jacob. Let me just kind of walk through these notes here real quickly. and We're, we're going to try to wind this down. Um, again, hearing in the Old Testament is the source of truth. I, Isaac blindly blesses jo Jacob. Verse 22, can I just read verse 22 to you again? Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he fell to him. And he says, the voice is Jacob's voice. His hands are the hands of Esau. Um, what, what did the serpent, I don't want to overplay this, what did the serpent say to Adam and Eve? Did God really say? Um, in the Old Testament, it's the hearing. How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Deuteronomy 4.12, the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sounds of the word, but you saw no form. There was only voice, but that was enough. Voice was the source of truth. But um, Isaac blindly disregards the voice and um, goes after touch, feel. And can I just, again, I, I want to pause because this is a really important point. This is the word of the Lord. And this is the source of truth, no matter how good something feels or how good it looks or how much sense it makes to my emotions. Truth is his word. Does that make sense to everybody? Really important truth here. Isaac missed it. So in verse 29, he blesses him. It's clearly the passing of the Abrahamic covenant on to Jacob. 
verse 30, it gets really sad because now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob. Jacob had just scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that he saw his brother came in from his hunting. He also had savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that your soul may bless me. His father said, his father Isaac said to him, who are you? He said, I'm your son, your firstborn son Esau. Isaac trembled. He knew what he had done. He trembled exceedingly. Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed, he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times, took away my birthright. And now look, he's taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have already made him your master. And all of his brethren I've given to him as servants with grain and wine. I've sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to the father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice, wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. It shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Timing is, again, a sign of God's providence throughout Scripture. Verse 33, Isaac trembles exceedingly. His whole plan and hope of a proper closure to his life has been irreversibly shattered. Esau had been treated unfairly, but was now reaping the consequences of his despising of the birthright. Bless me too, he said. Jacob, who means supplanter, came with deceit. It's going to cost him later. We'll get it. Chapter 29. He, it's going to start right away. He's going to He's going to reap what he has sown as well. Isaac intended to give all to Esau and only had an, what was really amounted to an anti-blessing to give to Esau. Esau is going to have a hard life, but he will live. Breaking the yoke is going to be fulfilled in 2 Kings 8, 20 through 22, fulfilled in biblical history, which means the promise of Jacob to Jacob will ultimately be fulfilled as well. Get to verse 41 and we'll... Bring this to a pretty quick close. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. The words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you've done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? So Esau, in his mind, thinks I'm going to kill my brother once my father's dead. Rebecca knows that he will act probably before then. So she tells Jacob to flee. She fears that Esau will kill Jacob and then an avenger would kill Esau and she would lose both sons in one day. Rebecca and Isaac in verse 46. Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be? They still are struggling with communication. She's mad at Esau because Esau married Canaanite wives. And um, getting into chapter 28, I'll read just the first few verses. Um, Isaac called Jacob and he blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's 
father, that's Rebecca's father, take yourself a wife from there, from the daughters of Laban, who is your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you, make you fruitful, and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Pradan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, mother of Jacob and Esau. So Jacob then escapes to Laban's house with his father's blessing. He's told to marry a wife from his uncle's family. That will be Laban. We'll talk about that next week. And then, lo and behold, remember I told you that the bookends of this section are the wives or the marriages of Esau. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badan Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Badan Aram. Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabajoth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. Almost out of spite, so angry at this point that he does that which upset his parents even more. He'd always wanted to fit in and be blessed, but he could never live up to Jacob. And now he marries an Ishmaelite, which is the offspring of the non covenant son of Abraham, Ishmael. Let me just give you these conclusions and I'll be done. Number one, Isaac's motives are questionable. But as he blessed Jacob, thinking that he was Esau, he did so believing in the power of God to communicate or transfer that blessing by faith. Blessing is transferred through the spoken word and we are still called to bless. Even those who curse us, grace is so clear in this narrative a family of failure and yet faith will fulfill the plan of God despite their own failure and their own sin. Number four, the family can see the fulfillment of prophecy, but only through blessing. Isaac and his blessing is a prophecy, but he just does not know of, of that which he speaks. Can I read you this quote? I know you can read it on your own. Uh, Eugene Roop was actually a professor of mine and he wrote a book. I had him in seminary. He said, the saga is not only about anger and division, but also about promise and hope. At the most dangerous moments, God appears. God comes to the thief, fleeing from the justified anger of his brother. God protects the refugee, trapped between the angry world of the present and the murderous hatred generated in the past. God calls again to the family, even after they have returned evil for evil against their neighbors. The promises which had called the family into being seem almost lost in the drama of this generation, almost, but not quite. The promises are heard again at night by a dreaming Jacob. That'll be next week. And in the worship of the Pilgrim family, God's unfinished story provides unending hope for the faith community. God cannot be silenced by conflict and alienation or chased away by exploitation, deceit, and violence. Similarly, Paul writes, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all that this is the all surpassing power which is from god and not from us in other words ultimately god's plan will be accomplished but it will not be because humanity is all that great it will be because of the power of god to accomplish it